Good to have Pastor Gary Zdarsky with us, and he's going to speak uh, tonight. He'll be with us uh, tomorrow uh, in chapel, in college chapel, and I was glad that he could come, bring his wife and some of his kids, and then he had to see the other ones, and I'm sorry about that. You know what I mean? He, he has three children here, and we tried to, we tried to campus them, um, but we don't really have that rule yet that you can't talk to your parents. Uh, we were trying to work it out before he came, but sorry. Uh, we weren't able to figure that out, but I was glad that he could come and be with us. Uh, he's the pastor of Tabernacle Baptist Church in Quincy, Illinois. He's been pastoring there now for about 14 years. In 2004, he graduated a long time ago. All right, he graduated a long time ago, and then his uh, wife uh, graduated also. His brother, Bob, uh, many people remember Bob. He's also a graduate of uh, our college. And Bob is pastor. Is he is he pastoring or an assistant? Where, in between right now, I know he graduated a long time ago too. All right, so, um, but uh, after graduation, Gary went back to Chicago because he grew up in the Chicago land, and uh, during his time as youth pastor, um, he reached uh, Pastor Lewis, and so I was glad Pastor Lewis could be here this evening and his girls, uh, taking uh, time to be with uh, Pastor, Pastor Zadarski. And so I was glad that he could come, uh, take the trek to come up here, be with us, uh, preach tonight and then in the morning. So uh, pray for Pastor Zadarski as he comes to preach. I'm supposed to talk to plants that makes them healthy. What happened to my amen pew? Just like in college. You know, they just disappear. <laughs> you want to sit here? I, li I like her up here, man. But no, it's good to see everyone again, get to meet some familiar faces, though the ones that did sit in the Amen pew just a little while ago, I think in college, if I remember, because it's been a long time since I graduated, I think they sat in the back. And I'm glad to see they've made their way to the front, if, you know, just to sing. And not for the preaching, but that's okay. At least we're making an inroad there. And I, I thought it was some new program the college was doing that if kids bring their parents and their parents take classes, they get like half tuition off or something like that. And, but uh, they're not in the college, and, but that's okay. They've done a great job decorating. I was wondering if Melania Trump came <laughs> and just spun her magic. Did Rosanna Ramos come? 
I was, I was just wondering. They said that maybe she has inroads with Melania or something on, on decoration or something like that. But it's no fun when they don't make, when they're not here. It's like so. I apologize. I'm, anyway, turn to Acts chapter twenty. <coughs> Acts chapter twenty. Really, I thought the only reason they wanted me to come back was to play Santa Claus. Short, fat, getting a little gray. But I could not borrow a red suit from anybody. So that's all right. Acts chapter 20. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> it slipped. But I was reading where they said that if you can get a good Santa Claus gig for one month, you can make like seven to $15,000 if you book the right jobs with the right businesses and stuff. So I won't be available next year. <laughs> so i um, going to have to back off on that one. But when I think of Christmas and why we as Christians should celebrate or commemorate this time of year, one idea comes to mind, I would say, more than others. And to me, the thought above all thoughts is giving. Now, we may look at it, and I guess growing up and being in the world for so long, I think back on my years of Christmases with the family, with the grandparents, and different things. My parents are gone now. My grandparents are gone. Um, but I still can think back of the different times, getting together, um, opening the presents and different things like that, and the kids all wanting their fair share and uh, picking out at Christmas time, whose present was whose, and which was the biggest one, stashing other ones away, and so the other kids didn't get them. But that's a worldly view. What can I get? What can, what can we get? But when you think about it, Christmas is about giving. But it's about what God gave us. In Acts chapter 20, <coughs> verses 34 to 38, it says, Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities, and to them that were with me, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. The idea is more, um, excuse me, it, it is better to give than to receive, and hopefully that's your attitude, especially around this time of year. But it should be something that we as Christians have, have throughout the whole year. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, and you can all probably quote the rest, unto us a son is given. It says right there, God gave his only begotten son to us, the world has taken such a glorious concept and they've tainted it. They've warped it. They've turned the glory due only unto God and the Lord Jesus Christ into a lie which glorifies corruptible man. They've taken the idea of God giving His only begotten Son that, 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 that God would come and take upon the form of man, uh, uh, take upon human flesh, be born <coughs> in this world to a sinful, wicked world so that he could then die for us. He gave himself. The Bible in Romans chapter 1, I won't turn there just for sake of time. I got a lot of, a lot of notes. Um, the more I think I, I, I can go through them real quick, the, the less I find out I go through them quick. And if it's any comparison to what I did at church. I had two pages of notes at church Sunday and it took 45 to an hour. I have three pages and um, so I figured we'd be done in an hour and a half and uh, we'll get you home by Christmas Eve <coughs> so you can get your presents wrapped and get them under the tree. But it talks in Romans chapter 1, 21 through 23. In verse 23 as it says, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. How the world always takes what is good, always takes what is godly, and they ruin it. 
Romans 1.25, who changed the truth of God into a lie. The truth that Jesus Christ came to die for sinful man, that God loved us so much he gave his only begotten son, that he would do that for you, that he would do that for me. And what has the world done to it? They've taken that truth and they've mocked it and made fun of it and turned it into a lie. Verse 28 also of Romans chapter 1 and says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. They didn't even want to retain God in their knowledge, and that's the world we're living in today. It's Christmas. It's the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we honor, that we commemorate. But look what the world's done to it. So much so, they don't, they don't even want you to mention God in school. They don't want you to mention Jesus Christ. They don't want you to mention any of it. You can't even say Merry Christmas in some instances. That shouldn't stop us. Amen. It just shouldn't. It shouldn't stop us from at least letting people know what... It's coming out, man, I'm telling you. I know why they move now. It shouldn't stop us from telling people, we may not have to even go around saying, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, but if someone just came up to us and asked us what it means to us, we should be able to tell them. This isn't just some holiday where we get to get together with families. It's a time when we look back and thank the Lord for Him coming to this earth. And so today I just want to look at, tonight I want to look at some biblical examples of giving. Just some biblical examples simply of giving. Now, I know sometimes we think, uh-oh, he's going to talk about giving. Hold on to my pocketbook. Hold on to my wallet. You notice we didn't even take an offering today. When it's, not, it's not about money. When we talk about giving, it's not always about money. And that's what we want to look at today. It's some important aspects of giving that really has nothing to do with money. It has to do with your heart. It has to do with your life. I could ask the question, what are you giving God with your life? He gave you Jesus Christ. He gave you himself. What are you giving him in return? Now, we don't give back in order to be saved. We're saved by grace through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll hit that. But what are you giving the Lord? What have you given him with your life? Let's pray. Father, we do ask that you take these <clears throat> next few minutes, Lord, and that you would just speak to our hearts. Help us, God, to see how much you've given to us, Lord, and, and what your word says we should give unto you, Lord. I ask that you would speak to each one. I pray, God, if there's anyone here that does not know my Savior, Jesus Christ, and why we would honor such a, a time as this, that they would come to know him today. That they would put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and receive the gift of eternal life. Thank you for what you've done for us in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing we want to look at in Samuel 1.11. <coughs> Four examples of giving. We'll get right into it quick. Uh, 1 Samuel 1.11, it talks uh, about Hannah giving her child unto the Lord. Hannah gave her child unto the Lord. We see a clear example in the Bible of a, of, of a woman who had no child and, and pleaded with God and begged with God for a man-child, a son. And she vowed a vow unto God that if God would give her a son, she would give that child back unto the Lord so that he can serve God all his days. I would ask the question, have you given your children unto God? Those of you that are parents, those of you that have children, have you given them unto the Lord? Attending Fairhaven is a good start. Uh, uh, being in a good church and, and getting grounded in, but just attending Fairhaven does not mean that you've given your children unto the Lord. I'm sure there's been many Christians that have passed this way that have wanted to hold on to their children. Or they maybe had something else planned for their children. Well, I want my children 
to go out into the world and to, and to maybe make a living or to, to earn a living, somehow become someone, make a lot of money. And, you know, with that, they can then go and give to God and serve God. That's not giving your children unto the Lord. That's not the concept. That's not the idea that Hannah had. That's not the Bible concept. It says there, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come <coughs> upon his head. In Hannah's desire for her son, she promised God that she would give him unto the Lord. And many of us make that same promise. If you have children and you have not made that promise, I pray that that is your promise. That, that is your desire. To see not your children the wealthiest, the greatest missionary in the world, uh, you know, and, and pick out whatever else you may have planned, but that you would see your child serving God, doing whatever God would have with their life, you would just give them unto the Lord, take your hands off, and say, God, use them for whatever purpose you would have. Many make such a promise, but never follow through. How many people can you think of right now that maybe were in this church a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago? Those of us old people, even those on the front row, that graduated with different people, that while they were in college, that was their desire, man, to find a wife, to find a husband, to have children, and to give them unto God, and just to see them serve the Lord. Hannah did. The Bible says later on in that verse 27 and 28, For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there. Now, Lent doesn't mean she's given them and taken them back. I lent him my screwdriver, I lent him my power drill or my saw, and now I want my saw back. That's not, what it's, that's not the meaning of the word. She gave her son, Samuel, wholeheartedly unto the Lord. She lent him and says, as long as he liveth. Notice that word, as long as he liveth, he's lent. It doesn't say for five years, ten years. As long as he lived, he could be 55 years old, and she's in the grave. But you know what? He's still unto the Lord. He's still given unto the Lord. As parents, we do not have to make a promise such as Hannah made to give our children unto the Lord. As parents, we're commanded by God's word to train up our children in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. Genesis 18, Deuteronomy 6, Psalm 78, Ephesians chapter 6, and other passages of Scripture would have us give and train up our children so that when they become of age, that God says, I want to use them, that they're not going to fight it, that they're not going to buck it, that they're not going to turn their back on God, but that they'll simply say, Lord, here I am, send me. God calls our children, but we must give them first to the Lord. You do have to give them. As Christians, if we fail to give them to the Lord and try to hold on to them, we'll lose them. But in doing so, it will demand training. It seems like in today's day and age, we spend more time training dogs to sit, roll over, play dead, stay in the yard, than we do our own children. And it is a shame. Train them. God's given us as parents an obligation, if he blesses us with children, and they are a blessing, to take them and mold them and to get them God's word and to give them God's word so that they can live for him. Some people think, well, I'm just going to serve God. I'm going to go on with my life and serve the Lord, and God will take care of my kids. God will raise my kids. The Bible doesn't say, God, train up your children. It says, parents, train up your children. You train them up. 
Take what God's given you. Take the word of God. God's given you everything you need to, to, to succeed. <coughs> Prayer is going to be important. If you're not going to train them up, but also if you're not going to pray for them. Pray to do what? Well, one thing is to correct my mistakes. I'll be the first one to stand here right now and say, I've made mistakes in raising my children. We sit back on Monday morning and we look at the football game and says, man, if that coach would have only called this play, if that player would have only done this, if that person would have only done that, I can stand here and look back on, well, Joy's going to be 23. Her birthday's coming up. 20 what? 23, right? I think so. 23, 21, 19, 17, 15. Yep, I'm right. Uh, 23 <coughs> on the 16th of December. So y'all get him, get her some goodies, you know, some, some gift cards to Dunkin' Donuts that she can send back to me. And... Uh, <laughs> whatever else you hear that John <laughs> you yeah no there's only one person up here talking to you <laughs> I see you hurt my girl I'll kill you <laughs> okay you got that that's a promise Okay, promise. Okay, back to the message. God gave it to me. I had to say it. I could. <coughs> but I can look back as that Monday morning quarterback and say, you know what? I should have done this. I should have done that. But you know what? I can't go back and change it. I can't go back and remold my children. But boy, prayer does a whole lot. It calls upon God to over, 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 what word can I, man, I'm trying to, come, override my mistakes. And say, God, please, I've tried, I've made mistakes. Lord, can you override this situation? Can you overtake in this situation and, and help? Maybe if I didn't train them in a certain area or didn't, did, didn't enforce something in their life that needs to be. God, help them to learn it. But I think maybe more important than those, I can't say more important or not, but you need to be an example. Because you could do all the saying, you could do all the praying, you could do all the telling and all the showing of the Bible, but if you don't live it, you could forget it. Again, how many people, and, and, and again, we're not talking about preachers, we're not talking about staff or anything, but just Christians have lost their children. Christians that you've known, that I've known. I call it staff, you would call them fellow laborers in the church, teachers that I've known in the past that have lost their children. <coughs> I'm not going to stand here and point figures and say why, but I do know one thing. It needs to be real. They need to see a mom and a dad that love God, Amen. that serve God, that don't just tell them and, and preach it to them, but they're living that example. They can see it. It's real. To find out what happens to our families if we fail to be that godly example. If we fail to train our children and to give our families to God. Just read the account of Lot. We're talking about Brother Tim Vickers. He was preaching to the kids in the FBI club. And I'm sitting in the back while he was preaching this week. And he's, what we're doing this year is heroes and zeros for the Lord. And we take two weeks or one week is a hero, another week is a zero. So last week was Abraham and this week was Lot. And you know which is the hero and the zero. But when you look at Lot's life, yes, the Bible calls him a just man. Calls him righteous Lot. And I believe he was saved. I believe he... He believed God. But look at his family. 
What did he do? He put himself, he maybe put riches, he put ease, comfort, opportunity before his family. Two of his daughters were married to two uh, men. They, 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 didn't, they, they tried to get him to come. They tried to get him to leave, but the Bible says they mocked him. They made fun of him. They didn't even leave the, the, the city of Sodom. <coughs> Some will remain unsaved and mock. Some will hunger and desire the world. And then they cannot help but look back as they're being told to come out of the world. But boy, the world was just so, so, so alluring and so nice and so great and wonderful. Lot was the reason for that. Lot was the one that saw the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot was the one that was in the gate. And still some will just afterwards live in sin. Flounder in the world. Oh, they may escape the judgment that we see that Lot faced, the, the city of Sodom. But they'll flounder in this world and never serve God. That's why it's important. Give your families to the Lord. Which means give yourself to God. Hannah gave her child to the Lord. The widow gave her two mites. Now, ladies, I didn't say the woman gave her two cents. I didn't say that. We know that. That's, a, that's, that's written in there. That's a gimme. That, that, that we know. Women have no problem doing that. I was hoping to get a few amens from some of the husbands, but I know she said not to. That's okay. It's all right. And I'm not talking about, the, I don't want you to look at the money issue here as far as the giving. She gave her two mites. We know how the, the, the men, all, all the religious men came and Jesus was sitting over by the uh, or receipt of treasury and they came in and gave their money and threw their money in there. And then the widow gave her two mites. But let's look past the two mites. What caused this certain poor widow woman to cast in her two mites? You have the rich ones, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those that were walking past. And the Bible used that term, casting in. Man, they wanted people to see it. But the Bible uses the same term for this widow woman. She didn't just walk up, oh, poor me, this is all the money I have for this day, this is all the money I have for this week, and just with a glum face, drop it in, What's going to happen to me? No, the Bible says she cast it in just like they did. They did it to be seen. I believe she did it because she was happy and excited to do it. And he said of a truth, I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. cast in her two mites, but to her that was everything. On the outside, one might think that it's just a message of giving. But I want to look at what caused her to give that. See, I think the key to giving is your heart, not your wallet. Not the amount of money that goes in, but, but your heart. Are you willing to give in whatever area God wants you to give? Are you willing to give your family? Are you willing to <coughs> tithe and give offerings? Are you willing to give your life in a ministry? Are you just willing? You need a willing heart. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 23 says, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What's your heart like this morning? Because the condition of your heart is going to tell a lot of how you give unto the Lord, how you give back to God. He says, my son, attend unto my words and my sayings. Listen. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. 
Keep your heart with all diligence. The widow did not give into the offering to look good or to keep up with the rich man, the rich men, but she gave exactly what God wanted her to give. The only way for this to happen in your life is for your heart to be controlled by God. I know we live in a world where it says, you know, follow your heart. Every Hallmark movie, be careful. Oh, but they're clean and there's no you know, bad language in this. Yeah, but they sneak in there. Follow your heart. Do what your heart says. No, your heart better be controlled by God. You better have given your heart to God. Amen. And say, God, move my heart this way. Move my heart that way. Once you have a Christ-controlled heart, you're now ready to give unto the Lord that which He asks. If God has your heart, it's going to be no problem to give your children, to give your family. Husbands, it's going to be no problem to say, hey, I believe this is what the Lord wants of me, wants of us, and we're going to do it. <coughs> and I think there's something to it when, when a wife sees that. If a wife sees it's real in the husband, and that the husband's serious about giving their whole heart to God, not just a whim. I have a whim. I want to go to Poland. I want to be a missionary to Poland. That's what I want to do. Such a big country, millions of people, hardly any independent Baptist missionaries. So I've, I've been there twice, and there's that desire. But for now, it's a whim. My heart's given over to God, but if I were to take my wife over there now, it'd be a disaster. You say, why? Because God's not controlling and leading. I would have been. But if God sees it's real, one of you men, 40, 50 years old, can say, if God's leading in that direction, and says, hey, I want you to be a missionary, I want you to be a pastor, I want you to go in this direction, I want you to join up in the bus ministry, I want you to go into this ministry, and you're not sure, you're like, man, I don't think I could do that. But if you do it knowing that's what God wants and your heart's given over to Him, your wife will have no problem following if she's what she ought to be. And then the children see that mom's heart's in it and dad's heart's in it. And they'll follow. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect. I'm not going to say it's going to be a bed of roses. You'll have your problems. You'll have your struggles. But you'll have God's strength and you'll have God's power throughout. In order for the widow to give of her living, her heart had to be right. In order for you to give of your living, to give of your life, to give of your family, you must give your heart to the Lord to use, to mold, and to control. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, you know what it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so right away we hear that. And, My heart, it's so evil and wicked. It is. You can't trust it. You can only trust God who controls it. But the good thing is, the next verse says, I, the Lord, search the heart. There is someone that does know your heart, and you can give your life over to them, you can give your heart over to them, and they know it, and they can guide and direct you and lead you. Amen. Give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. It doesn't have to be you thinking you know what you're doing. It's just giving it over to God, following His leading, and knowing this is what God wants. Amen. Thirdly, depending how you like to say it, Ornan or Arana. I don't, I don't know if that's how you say it. Arana, Aruna. So I'll, I'll keep Ornan. That's the easy one. Ornan gave it all. You have the widow giving her two mites. Her heart was right. You had... Hannah giving her child to the Lord. Now you have a man. And we're going to kind of just, just quickly go through the whole incident, but he gave it all. He didn't hesitate. He didn't step back and say, well, I don't know if I can. No, he just gave it all. Are you willing to give all, to give everything to the Lord? I can give in this area. Because everybody's in this area. You know, I, I can go here because, boy, I, I can work the bus ministry 
Because, man, everyone's doing it, but I don't think I could do the nursing home, even though God wants me to do nursing home. See, there's a thing. You've got to know what God wants. Because <coughs> when God calls and God moves, you've got to be willing to give it all. We know David numbered the children of Israel. Wasn't supposed to. And in 1 Chronicles 21, <coughs> 1 through 4, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, The Lord make his people a hundred times so many more than they be, but my Lord the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then do, doth my Lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab, wherefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. He numbered the children of Israel, but that was something he wasn't supposed to do. Because in verses 7 and 8, the Bible says, And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. Because David did that which was sinful, God is going to judge him. And God is judging the nation of Israel because of their wickedness. But to be merciful unto David, God commands David to sacrifice on an altar to him. It says in verse 18 of the same chapter, <coughs> Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David, that David should go up and set up the altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord, and Ornan turned back. And saw the angel and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor, bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant it to me for the full price, that the plague may be stayed from the people." And as we see here, David sins. And now God says, I'll be merciful and we could stop this thing. Go and build an altar and sacrifice. And so David goes exactly where God told Gad the prophet to send him to the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And that's where David goes and man, there's Ornan and his four sons. They're threshing wheat. They're, they're, they're just hard at it working. And they see David coming. And he runs over to David and bows down to David and, and just does obe uh, obeisance to, to, to the king. And the king said, I need your property. i got to build a sacrifice. i got to build an altar. i got to sacrifice unto the Lord because he's going to stop the plague that's spreading throughout Israel. David's fault. Why, don't, why, why doesn't... Go find it someplace else, David. You did it. You fix it. Ah, this can be a great time. David, man, he really made a mess of things. He said he'll pay me the full price. I can give him whatever price I want. I can be a rich man. Hey, I got four kids. <laughs> man, we, we, we could be living high off the hog. I can give him whatever price I want. But that's not what he did. Notice in verse 23, And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee. And let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. <coughs> Lo, I give thee the oxen also for burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meat offering. I give it all. Man, can we put ourselves in Ornan's shoes today? Could that be you? Can that be me? Can we say that I give it all? Not to David, a king. Not in the sense as a pastor to the pastor. Lord, I give it all. I don't care what it is you want of me. Whatever it is you want done, Lord, I give it all. 
David just needed the ground. David just needed the area. But Ornan said, no, David, I'll give you the animals for the offering. I'll give you the instruments for the wood to burn on it. That's all you're going to have to do is, 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 is to uh, uh, put up the altar. I'll even give you the wheat for a meat offering. I'm giving it all. <coughs> you think, well, I may be doing enough. But are you giving all? That's all you got to ask yourself. That's all you have to be concerned with is not other members comparing yourselves by yourselves. Am I doing as much as so-and-so? Am I doing as much as, as the staff? No, God, have I given all to you? Because that's where you'll be judged. Did you give your all to God? God's not going to stand one bus captain up against another and say, okay, let's see who did the best job. Okay, you lose. Boop. Okay, that's not the way it's going to work. God will simply say, and again, this isn't entrance into heaven. That's by grace through faith. This is, this is, this is the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to give an account for what we've done in our bodies, whether it be good or bad. And he'll just simply say, have you given your all? Remember, I gave my all to you. Remember, you commemorated every... 25th of December you think about it you sing about it you, you, you preach about it I gave my all have you given your all to me it doesn't matter what you're doing for the Lord you may give yourself your family your heart your wealth your time your talent but whatever you give it must be your all don't hold back one child give them all don't say, I'll give my family, but I'm not going to give myself. Well, I want to see my kids do a lot. Or maybe the reverse. I'll do, Lord, whatever you want, but please, not my kids. I, uh, I see enough missionaries and I hear enough stories, Lord. I don't want that to happen to them. And you miss the whole picture. You miss the glory and honor that they're bringing God. Our minds shouldn't be set. Yes, everybody has hardships. Yes, there's areas where some are working amidst Muslims or amidst China and communist areas. Sam Kim and his family. We support a fellow named um, Isak Marzouk. Another fellow that does an orphanage in, in, in another country that's predominantly Muslim. And, and they're not exactly kind to, to, to what they're doing and what they're teaching. And we'll look at that and say, hmm. You know, grandma and grandpa, we want our, our children here so we can see our grandchildren. I don't want to have to go once every five years to, to, to halfway around the world, to Mexico, to China, to, to, to these places. I want them with me. Give it all. God can do more and be more effective, more powerful results more lasting with you giving all to him than you keeping it. See, again, remember, remember the whole idea of how the world has warped things? What do we say? I can do more with the money that the taxes, my health savings, than the government can. I can do more. Give it to me. God says, no, you can't do enough. I can. Give it to me. Whatever God wants from you, will you give it without hesitation? And lastly, I think we all know this verse, John 3, 16. The last example is God gave his only begotten son. I leave this for last because I always like to leave the best for last. God gave his son, God came. He took upon him the form of flesh was born to this old sinful wicked world and I know we think it's wicked now and it is but it was wicked back then <coughs> for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life why would we perish because we're sinners there's one thing keeping us from heaven and that's simply sin sin. We're all born with it. We all commit it. 
And if that sin isn't dealt with the biblical way, when we die, there's only one place for us to go, and that's hell. But God gave himself, God gave us Jesus Christ to do what? To take our place. You talk about a gift. Again, my mind goes back to all the different gifts that were under the tree. In one year for Christmas, I got all those 8 millimeter films that my aunt had. And they were of Christmas. They were of some of them. I'm, I'm kind of ashamed to say what happened on some of them because I was only a little kid. I had no control over what was going on. But took them and put them on one DVD. And so we're able to see all the different things. And man, Christmas after Christmas after Christmas, you know, Santa Claus coming, that, that's, that's the way we were raised. He's not real. Some of you are crying. No, no, I, honest, he's not. Don't cry, though. Honest. Man. The Easter Bunny's not real either, just, just so you know. Okay, I mean, if we're going to open it up, man, we ought to open it up. <laughs> Neither is Cupid. Some of you girls think Cupid's real. I'm going to get that guy in college. No, Cupid's not real, okay? You can put all the perfume you want on. It's not going to work, okay? I'm going to... I'm, I'm getting off that, you know, leprechauns aren't real, all, all that, okay? It's not real. But I'll tell you something that is real. Jesus Christ is real. Amen. God's real. Take a look around. Take a look at the trees. Take a look at the mountains. Turn on my computer and, you know, that Bing picture pops up. <laughs> I wish I was there. Okay, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me for being, you know, covetous. And then there was a picture. I'm like, man, that place is nice. And I try to look and see where it's at. Zakopane, Poland. All right, all right, man. That's Polish mountains and a little rock path. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm going, I'm going. You look at those things. And how could there not be a God? Look at the ocean. You look at the animals. How could there not be? unto us a child is born unto us a son is given Romans 5 6 and 8 for when we were with yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly for scarcely for a righteous man <coughs> will one die yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us he loved you enough so much. I don't want to say loved you enough. It's not like he had to struggle to love. There was no struggle at all. God gave of himself. God gave it all. All those little aspects. His heart was pure. His heart was perfect. And he did it for you and me. Not so that we can give presents and have all this fun that we have at this time. No, he did it so that he can save your soul from everlasting torment, everlasting punishment in hell and give you a home in heaven. Man, what a present. I don't care if it's going to be, if I go and die in February, January, March, June, July, I get to heaven I'm waiting to see my mansion. I won't have to unwrap it. It'll be there. You talk about Christmas. You talk about... It's wonderful. <coughs> We're without strength to save ourselves. Without strength to rid ourselves of our sin. But Jesus Christ was given... So that he could be our substitute. So that he could take our place. The substitute must be blameless. The substitute must be pure. The substitute must be holy. There could be no sin. That's why parents can't do anything for their children. No religious leader can do anything for the people that follow. 
Only God's son fits the qualification. Only Jesus lived a perfect life and without sin so that he can take your place and die in your stead. When's the last person you've ever heard of wanting to die for you? Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All we like sheep have gone astray, Isaiah 53, 6. We have turned <coughs> every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him, Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. 1 John 3, 16. There's another 3, 16. Another John 3, 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He laid down his life for you. See, the whole Christmas season is wrapped up in this thought of giving. The whole Christmas season is made possible because of the greatest gift that was given to mankind just over 2,000 years ago in the person of Jesus Christ. To receive this gift of eternal life and sins forgiven, you must by faith realize Jesus is the only way to heaven. Turn from your sins, turn from your life, Turn to God. Call upon Him for forgiveness of sin. You're not going to find it anyplace else. He was given to the world. For God so loved the world, He was given to the world, but specifically He was given to you if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior in here tonight. We can make it a broad statement and say to the world, but if you don't know Christ, He came for you. Personal. You don't have 100% assurance that heaven is your home tonight. Why not trust Christ, God's greatest gift to mankind as your Savior? If you know Christ and have accepted God's gift, how's your giving tonight? Given of your family, given of yourself, given of your children. Are you giving out of a right heart? Is your heart given over? Are you giving all and not holding anything back for the Lord? I think that's how he would like us. To remember him, to honor him, to commemorate what he's done for us. Don't get caught up in everything that's going on. I'm not saying don't give out gifts. I'm just saying don't get caught up so much that we lose the true meaning of what he's done for us and what we can do for him. Let's pray. Father, I pray tonight, <coughs> I first thank you, Lord, for those that were attentive and everyone as they listen. I know it's not easy sometimes, but Lord, there may be those here tonight. God, they don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. They don't know for sure heaven is their home. But I pray that they would want to. Pray, God, that there may be Christians here that have not given of themselves to give their family, have not given their heart totally to you, have not given all, but maybe in one little area holding back. That can lead to a life of misery, a life of regret. Pray, God, good decisions will be made. In Jesus' name. Let's please stand with our heads bowed, eyes closed, please. We will give an invitation as the instruments come. But maybe you came with a